Ecofictologists, welcome back to the channel. My name is Louis, and today I am delighted to introduce you to Mary Woodbury, who was kind enough to agree to do a little interview with me. Hi, Mary. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, many of you will recognize her name. She runs the amazing Dragonfly Eco site, um, which is just a fantastic resource for anybody wanting to know more about eco-fiction as well as eco-literature and all kinds of um, related areas and genres. And now I'm just happy that she's here and talking. Thank to you me. for having me. I, I love your video show. <laughs> I think it's a great um, additional voice to this genre, this whole field of literature, and um, you're really doing an excellent job. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, so you recently celebrated eight years of your website, Dragonfly Eco. Um, that's a big milestone. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Uh, what inspired you to start the site in the first place? Um, I, I guess it was just, you know, from the time I was a little girl, I loved reading fiction um, that had, was set in the outdoors or brought in nature, you know, when I was smaller, I really loved reading the animal fables and fairy tales. Mm -hmm. um, so that just kind of stayed with me my whole life. And when I got to be an adult, I was kind of just wanting to do some kind of literary project. And I thought, why don't I, I just do something on, you know, novels that explore ecofiction and climate change because I was actually writing one when I first came up with the site and by the time I put it together it was already published um, and I was interested in what else was out there for one so the site started small it was kind of a list of other novels in the similar vein as mine but then it's just grown so much throughout the past eight years yeah it's it's quite an extensive list now quite an extensive database yeah. and and a lot of author interviews which are really fascinating to read um did you did you kind of expect that that eco fiction and eco literature would become like a bigger thing and there would need to be a place for for people to go and and be able to learn about it and and kind of have a database yeah i felt that i was seeing uh, more novels, especially about climate change these days. I think more and more authors are uh, really digging into it because it's just becoming, I mean, I think we've known about it, but it's just becoming more and more obvious about what we're seeing everywhere in our world right now. So, um, I mean, ecofiction has a long history going back to the 1970s, but um, it's kind of evolving as any genre will to um, look it look not just I think when it first started it was kind of back to the land um, and there was some environmental science fiction uh, too but it just seems to be evolving more and more as we see more ecological crises in our world right now and um, but no I didn't think it was going to get as big as it's getting uh, but it's good to see for sure Definitely, definitely. And you run a publishing house as well, don't you, called Dragon mm -hmm. 5 Publishing, um, mm -hmm. which, which published your first book, right? Um, actually, the first press that I opened was over a decade ago, Moon Willow Press. And I primarily uh, published other authors who are writing mostly what I consider ecofiction. Um, there's at least one or two nonfiction books, I think, but I did publish my first book through that press. And I decided after 11 years that I really, it's too much for me. I mean, I made that decision when I was working full time and it was just like, I can't, I can't really do this. And that's I wanted lot. to get back to my own writing. <laughs> I, I mean, the last time I really published was in 2014. So yeah, Dragonfly Publishing is an offshoot of Moon Willow Press. I'm actually closing Moon Willow Press after the current author contracts run out in 2022. And Dragonfly Publishing will be my own place for self-publishing novels. Um, but it's a little bit more than just self-publishing because I don't plan on publishing 
you know, enough novels, I guess, myself. I sometimes will share short stories or, uh, you know, web projects such as dragonfly.eco. And um, I'm even thinking in the future about possibly doing an anthology. I've published one before with several writers. It was uh, Winds of Change, short stories about our climate. Might do something like that in the future. But um, for right now, I've just got to get away because as a sole proprietorship with no staff, I do everything. <laughs> <laughs> I write, I edit, I format the book. Um, I just got my newest book into print and to the printer last night and I was like dealing Oof. with these small issues <laughs> you know it's not published it's not converting oh it's the font this one font I used and oh. that kind of stuff is just like I want to get away from it and just concentrate on what I'm doing with dragonfly.eco and and doing my own writing occasionally yeah that makes sense that sounds like a lot that you're doing a lot <laughs> it was and a what lot. you and what you just published was a novella it was called bird song which you published under yes. your under your pen name clara hume right you even pronounce clara the right way <laughs> um i <laughs> it's not quite out yet it comes out november 4th but um the kindle is on pre-order and um hopefully everything will go okay it's a printer and it will actually come out on november 4th but yeah i'm excited about it's a novella which um, was a little bit easier to tackle than a whole novel. <laughs> yeah, but. for sure. Can you give us a brief kind of spoiler-free summary of, of what the book's all about? Sure. It's about a young girl. Um, she's done with high school and she wants to go to college, um, but she lives uh, in a poor section of Chicago and her mother had just died in the previous year and she's just kind of at a limbo in her life. She lives with an alcoholic uncle um, and she, she has a lot of dreams, but she just kind of paralyzed in her situation. And she wakes up one morning, you know, she goes to sleep and it's this cold Chicago night and she wakes up and she's on this warm Island. And, you know, I, I don't want to spoil it at all, but it's, um, it's a young adult story about a woman who, uh, has dreams and she wants to figure out her life. Uh, she, kind of does so with the help of the weird going on on the island. Um, she runs into some sirens, so there's some Greek mythology to it. And um, I played around with uh, what I consider ecological weird fiction, which yeah. I hadn't tried before. <laughs> I've heard that I've heard you mention the term before I was gonna ask. I know you it's like trying, you know, a new food or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you expand a bit on what ecological weird is? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's just, um, I think it's, it is what it sounds like it is. It's a weird fiction with a strong sense of ecological um, setting. Uh, but it's not just a background setting. There's some actual s stuff going on, some ecological weird things in the, in the book that... Um, kind of make it so that the plot and the characters it, it kind of moves their decisions and and emotions and I think for readers uh, weird fiction is a good way especially if we're talking about ecological climate crises to um, to kind of symbolize what's going on in our real world but do so in a weird fashion through plants and animals and such. And, and um, you know, but you look at our world, our world is also weird. <laughs> and we have a lot of weird, um, you know, species that we don't really understand completely and who are just, you know, are amazing, like fungi and <laughs> everything. So um, I think that that kind of writing a story based on something that's, weirder than our weird in a, in a way um, can help us kind of have this uh, bigger perspective on um, what some people call it when they're talking about weird if fiction they talk about the other um, and in this case it's the other would be some kind of ecological event or animal or tree that's just behaving weird you know <laughs> so um, it's just another way to do some symbolism, like just 
what fiction is full of. And I think it works if you're, if you're like me, um, you kind of like to have a, a psychological slow burn in a, in a film or movie and it doesn't have to be uh, jump scares, but it, you know, anything that really makes you think and then you come back later and go, whoa, that was, I'm not, I'm not saying that my novella is going to be that good, but <laughs> some of the weird fiction that I've, I've read has really affected me quite a bit. Oh, well, I'm very intrigued. <laughs> ecological weird. I'm not sure I've read ecological weird. Yet. Oh yeah. I think I was going to mention in the answer to that is um, Jeff Vandermeer, for instance, uh, writes some weird fiction. Um, Marion Womack, I, you probably know her from Twitter. Um, she's, she's written some and her PhD was actually kind of at the intersection of weird and eco fiction, which, so that's kind of how I came across her. Um, but yeah, there's just so many writers like it, I don't think they're going, oh, I'm going to write some ecological weird fiction. It's <laughs> just like, they're just going into it. And, um, you know, th that's, that's kind of how I found out about it, I guess. It's just, um, it was actually from reading Jeff Vanderbeer's uh, Weird Compendium, which is, he did, I believe, with his wife, Anne. And um, it's just like, a, a they they do these super huge books. They do one on science fiction, fantasy, and they did one on weird fiction. But some of the stories that I found in there were definitely ecological. And that's how I started thinking, wow, that's, that affects me almost more than anything I've ever read. So wow, <laughs> kind of follow it. Well, that's great. What made you decide to be an author as well as just educating people about um, eco fiction and eco literature was, or did that come first where you were author first and, and then yeah. decided to start the site? I, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've always written um, since I was a young girl, but it wasn't really until I published my first novel, Back to the Garden, that I was interested. And, in, you know, because at the time, I'm like, who is writing about climate change in fiction? I knew that there was some older science fiction that dealt with weather, <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> long-term climate change. Um, some of the earliest I found out was from the 1970s and onward. Um, but I was trying to figure out who is doing this, you know, today. And I started finding people and um, I just started a list of books. But so I guess it was my own writing and prior influences that um, have always made me interested in eco fiction. And then, you know, yeah, I think it was also my perspective as an author it's like you know who else is interested in this and writing about this and you know I came to find out well hundreds of people are <laughs> but it took me a while it took a little bit of research because when I started this back in 2012 2013 um there was I, people were definitely writing about it but I think since then it's really become a lot bigger than it was even not even less than 10 years ago. So, um, and that may just be my own, you know, maybe other people always knew about it before I did. But I, I just thought this is interesting and I want to provide a reference for others who are writing or just reading or just interested in the field. So apart from it getting bigger and more popular and more people knowing about it, what other trends have you seen in this genre this category of books over the years since you've been kind of um I compiling. <laughs> yeah I think outside of terminology like genre term terminology which um some people kind of like to box it up into one mm -hmm. uh term I tend to see like a bigger perspective and I think part of that is just because eco-fiction itself um has kind of been defined as in two different ways. One is a genre on its own, and the other is like a, a composite subgenre, which can really just um, give impulse to all these other genres like science fiction, medical realism, um, you know, fantasy, romance, uh, thriller, mystery, crime, detective. I mean, it's in every, you can find novels in every field. I kind of like that perspective the best because I don't think that when we come to trying to define a, a 
a label, a genre label for these novels, we're always, we always run into the possibility that we're going to go, oop, no, this book isn't, but this mm. book is. And I just like the inclusivity of ecofiction. Um, well, I guess one of the trends is that it, it is a diverse world. And um, because of that, we do see not just one genre, but several genres. Um, and what I have always kind of liked to see and what I'm seeing more of probably in the last two or three years is that in the beginning, it seemed like uh, ecofiction was written, I would say not all, but dominantly um, men, white men <laughs> uh, from North America or Europe and maybe Australia. But now we're seeing that uh, this field is diverse as it should be. And um, more and more, you know, I'm looking around and seeing more and more uh, from, you know, indigenous people who have probably always written about it, but it just hasn't, like, it hasn't been in the media as much. And so it's harder mm -hmm. to find um, people of color, people from other countries. Um, and I think this, this trend is very important um, because, you know, I would say a lot of people from North America, I mean, I'm going to include myself in this, we write from privilege, like from a privileged surrounding, like we're not really seeing the brunt of climate change around us. We are concerned, we have every right to, to be concerned. We, um, you know, might be privileged, but we are compassionate and that's good. I mean, we all should be kind of looking into this field as writers, if, if that's what interests us. And, um, but it's, you know, I mean, I think that we just do need as many voices as possible to kind of hold up Mother Earth <laughs> and our, our concerns about what's happening in our world today. But to me, um, some of the most impactful fiction that I've read, period, is really from a place of um, pain, almost. And I think it's like listening to the blues, you know, you just sometimes get drawn into it because it's born from pain. And um, in that sense, it's maybe more impactful than like a pop culture song that <laughs> doesn't really say a lot. <laughs> but um, I'm trying to find more and more literature like that, that's really born from someone who's kind of more on the front lines of climate change, maybe they live in a place where um, they're a climate refugee or, you know, they're working with people or they're, it's around them or, you know, maybe their landscape has really been a lot more changed than like something, somebody like my landscape, which is changing. And I know that it is biologically and ecologically, but it's not so evident quite yet. And um, I just think for us to be able to read novels set in other places, people from other cultures really will give us a perspective of um, a bigger perspective and a kind of a wholer viewpoint of what is going on around the world. And actually, um, I, for my eighth anniversary at Ecofiction, I had done this survey. I don't know if you and I ever talked about it, <laughs> but I, I, I saw you post about it. I saw the, yeah. yeah. But I, it, was, it was just a survey of the social impacts of um, people reading ecofiction, basically. And a couple of the questions uh, dealt with, you know, what are some of the things that are most impactful for you? And it's interesting because I asked the question in two different ways, at different parts of the survey. And in one, I provided like what the kinds of answers that I kind of have observed from just the categories of novels that are at my site, which is up, up to 800, I think, or more. And then the other question was more open-ended, but both answers had to do with people wanting to read um, and being really impacted by reading stories from other places and from other cultures. So um, if it's a trend, I think it's widening a little bit. And, you know, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It sounds like a good thing. More, 
the more perspectives that we can have access to, the better. And the better we're yeah. going to understand yeah, because what's it's a, happening. From... Climate change is like a global issue. Absolutely. And it's not just... <laughs> No, exactly. And all the all the different perspectives should be represented. And you mm -hmm. you do a, a big spotlight on that on your site. And I think it was for Medium, the round the world and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's it, yeah. What's it called? I, around the world in 80 books or. Uh, around the world in 80 books is, is the title. And then it had kind of a longish subtitle. <laughs> yeah, I. I done two of those now and the most recent one was is just like last month I think um and but I also do well since this site started um well actually my site started in 2013 and I had been doing interviews at that time but in 2016 I started like a climate change author spotlight but a couple of years later I changed that to um a world ecofiction um spotlight because I noticed that I was falling into this thing where I, almost everyone that I am writing about is from North America, <laughs> you know, and I just felt like this is, you know, there's a lot of popular authors that get mentioned like Mark Atwood, um, Kim Stanley Robinson and, you know, but we really need to kind of go more around the world and recognize other people. So in 2018, I changed it to that and I still will look at, North American authors, but no more than I look at authors from any other continent, you know. Well, that's really, that's, that's an amazing um, resource for people because I've noticed it as well. I've no I noticed that many of the books that are, many of the ecofiction books that are popular, that whose titles I see often or with interviews with the author, they tend to be North American um mm -hmm. so i'm trying to challenge myself to to stretch a yeah, little bit as well but as i definitely be i have noticed the trend like it's in the past i'd say uh well ever since you know um probably the last two or three years it's been getting much wider like as far as uh, you know authors and looking at stuff i think black Mo black lives matter really propelled even more so um you know, I know that your section on Black authors was awesome. I learned a lot from it. So thank oh, you. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that has made people really even, I mean, Black Lives Matter has been around for a long time, but th this past year, um, along with so many other things, like some terrible things happened and we just constantly have to be reminded and open our eyes further and really um, promote black authors um and not just black authors but you know people all people of color indigenous voices i think absolutely. it's really important absolutely what do you think i mean ecofiction is growing but what do you think needs to happen for it to kind of merge more into the mainstream i probably wouldn't wouldn't say that it's mainstream just yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's hard to say, like, if we're just talking about the term ecofiction, um, I think it's more, almost more of an academic term still than like a public relations type term or a marketing term. I'm not sure if it will ever get huge. And in a way that's um, kind of nice because once start, things start getting big, there's a certain kind of um, commodification to that. And, um, you know, it's, but to me, ecofiction is not just the label, it's the actual stories. And they're not always called ecofiction. They might be called Afrofuturism or <laughs> science fiction or whatever, but the stories themselves, if they're very strongly ecologically aware and, you know, don't cut out that crucial connection to our environment and even possibly may be an advocacy story and raise you know concerns hopefully not too preachy because my survey showed we don't like that <laughs> you know that we don't like turns that people off. <laughs> um but yeah i think we're already seeing these stories start becoming more and more mainstream i mean look at jeff's jeff vandermeer's um you know 
Southern Reach trilogy was huge. And so has, has books been since. I think even he's doing a new one, Hummingbird Salamander. And I read, I don't think it comes out till next year, but I read that it was optioned by somebody to become a series or a movie or something. Oh, I can't goodness. remember exactly. Yeah, but so they are becoming mainstream. It's just when people read them, they're, they're definitely going to find out um, if they go past just the movie or the book that, and if they are reading and watching, they're like, whoa, this is maybe saying something about our natural world. And, but that doesn't mean they have to go, oh, hey, it's eco-fiction <laughs> or, you know, anything like that. Um, so no, to me, eco-fiction is more the stories and instead of genre labels, um, I don't think the label will get big, but I think the stories are already becoming more mainstream because more people in our world are getting concerned about, you know, our mm -hmm. crises on our planet. And it's good to see in stories about who we are. <laughs> Absolutely. I recently uh, had a chat with John Juncker, the co-founder of um, oh, Ashland yeah. Creek Press. Yeah. And, um, he was saying that that some of these some of these topics are you know because they're quite confronting. Um, maybe ten years ago, pub big publishers didn't know how to market it. They didn't mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do with these kinds of messages. And now it's becoming a bit a bit more yeah. um, a bit easier for to be picked <laughs> up by big publishers. Um, but That's there true. are there are always outlets for people to for authors to get their stories out there and the stories are what matter. It's not necessarily. Yeah. Which, I, I do have some it. good news. I, I noticed last night when I was uploading my book and you, ha you have to pick like the categories, like the genre categories. I've worked with Ingram for like yeah. the past um, probably 10 years or so. They never used to have um, any kind of nature environmental fiction category to describe your book. Now they do for Ooh. adults. There used to be one for children and then there was nature, environmental, nonfiction, but there was nothing fiction for adults. And I just noticed for the first time, of course, I haven't really published a book for a couple of years, I think now, but just for the first time yesterday, I thought, oh, they actually have nature and environment for fiction. Oh, that's a step forward. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Amazon does yet, but we'll, no. we'll see. Maybe eventually they will. Yeah, uh, Sally Cole Mish, who I interviewed a little while ago, she said that she tried to give it that kind of eco fiction or something mm -hmm. related that um, yeah. label, and and Amazon didn't have it. So maybe maybe Ingram will be the start of a of <laughs> yeah. the industry trend. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, when I released my uh, conservation in eco fiction video, you and I had a brief conversation about. Um, the categories on your database because you have mm -hmm. one called animal and then and um you were wondering whether to change it to conservation yeah. and i said that featuring animals and featuring the conservation of animals were two different things and i just um i wondered um what you think the difference is in impact of mm -hmm a book that just makes us love an animal or feel mm -hmm. awe or in um, wonder for nature and one that actually actively promotes the protection of that thing. Mm -hmm. I think both are probably important. Um, personally for me, I think when I, you first sent me the questions, I, that's why I was getting my glasses on because I always forget the name of this movie. It's um, Okja. Okja. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's based on a this little girl who lives in South Korea and her family has is like for the government or some kind of corporation is has genetically modified super pigs. And so she helps raise one named Okta. And it's just such a heartwarming story because the poor pig gets, you know, once it gets huge, it's been taken off back from the corporation and she actually goes with some friends to help rescue it and bring it back home. And um, that kind of story to me is, you know, even as an adult, <laughs> like I don't know if that was meant for children or adults or both, 
but as an adult, I actually cried during that movie because it was just so sad. And, you know, then I had to think back, like, um, in my life, like how, you know, how did I feel like how, you know, how did I ever get to this point that I feel like we should protect animals? And it wasn't because I grew up learning about conservation so much. It's because I grew up reading stories about animals in need or even plants like the giving tree uh, or animals like Bambi. And you kind of have this empathy and, and sympathy toward animals. And that's something that fiction does. It's another part of my survey, by the way. Um, <laughs> empathy is like almost one of the most important things. And I think that um, even studies that I've read that are listed in that survey um, show that when we read fiction and we relate to a story, you know, psychologically something's going on that helps us, enables more empathy within us if we're touched by the story. So in that sense, I think that those stories about animals or could be trees or whatever, they, they nurture, you know, that empathy in us. And then we grow up, like, the next part of that is caring part is then wanting to protect. And so um, I think those stories are really important. As far as conservation, though, it's always interesting to read stories about, you know, people who maybe want to go off and work on a preserve of some kind and there's some stories like that floating around and they're really good and it kind of also empowers you as an adult to realize it doesn't matter where you're at um, maybe your personal emotions or life isn't all that great but you can always gain something by you know looking outside of your own tragedies or <laughs> boring life or whatever <laughs> and you know, maybe try doing something like that. And I think that's important too. So I think both stories can, can come at you. I just think that the most important stories have some element in them that um, reaches out to our hearts. And I think that that's like everybody I've ever talked to will come to that same con conclusion. So maybe it's not so much the subject matter as much as it is just telling a wonderful story that people can relate to. That's a really good point. Um, what we have an emotional connection to, I suppose we have a, an immediate instinctual response to try and protect it. So yeah, having one, you know, having the conservation stories without creating any empathy probably doesn't achieve very much. Right. Um, in that same video, I said I would love to see more ecofiction focusing on conservation because that's something that I'm very passionate about and something that I don't see a lot of, you know, these stories representing the work that people are doing to try and, and conserve the species that we're losing. Um, what kind of thing would you like to see more of um, become more popular or, or just more stories being told um, that are not being told right now? Um, I think it, to go back to my earlier um, points about the, the kind of the trend of more diversity within this field, I'd love to see more of that. I'd love to be able to write a Medium article and not have to scour for hours just to find, you know, novels written and said in South America, for instance, like, you know, that are getting decent review, you know, like good novels. Um, I'd love to see that more of that in every part of the world. Um, outside of that, I, I can't really, I mean, other than my personal preference for weird fiction, <laughs> um, which is happening. It, it is, it's happening like in the, in eco fiction. Um, I can't really think off the top of my head of something more than I would like to see, I guess. Yeah. Well, the more diverse voices would definitely be a massive, a massive plus. So yeah. fingers crossed, we hope to see that. Yeah, because I think it's not just that, it's what we'll see is something that will take us beyond our backyard and doorstep, right? We would see maybe 
somebody totally in a different place and a different experiences. And I think that that helps us get more empathy and helps us learn more. And, you know, it might capture our imagination better because we're not kind of have this tunnel vision or something. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, kind of touching on that ecological weird kind of using metaphor and um, allegory and things. You and I are part of a group on Goodreads for people interested in ecofiction and representing the environment in, in literature. Um, mm -hmm. There was an interesting discussion on that group about whether ecofiction should be earthbound mm -hmm. or, um, you know, whether it even, whether it should even include genres like fantasy or sci-fi that is in space that's that's not earthbound mm -hmm. and you and i seem to be of a similar opinion that that it should encompass um fantasy and and everything yeah. not it should encompass real. every genre it should <laughs> encompass every genre and that excluding them would be would be losing something um totally be losing a lot um yeah what do you think we would lose if if we were to exclude things that were not earthbound and not kind of realistic <laughs> Uh, we'd lose a lot of readers. <laughs> we would lose we'd a lot lose of readers. <laughs> some of the most important authors who are writing, um, you know, science-based, you know, even though fiction itself veers off into the imagination, most eco-fiction is based off credible science. <laughs> um, I remember taking a science fiction and fantasy class in college, and that was like one of the first things they told us. And I'm like, wow, I never, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's, it seems so much more incredible. But actually the, the term eco-fiction, um, I think, well, I was, have always referred to Jim Dwyer's field guide mm -hmm. to eco-fiction. Well, where the wild books stories are. will take us yeah. or something like that. Where the wild <laughs> or, yeah, books where the wild are. books are. And um, he said, and the book that the first time he had heard of the term was based on this anthology edited by John Statler back in the, well, I think the anthology came out in the 1970s, early 1970s, but it included science fiction and fantasy stories, like from the 1930s on, and it had like huge authors from the, that, those times, you know, like... <laughs> I, I can't even remember them off the top of my head right now. On the spot, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to say like Asimov um, and a bunch of other, I want to say Jules Verne, but I'm not positive about that. Um, the Birds, you know, that old science fiction movie that's kind of freaky, that yeah. the story was in there. So um, that was, I mean, to take it, to take science fiction fantasy off the table, like, you know, a half a century later, just because somebody goes, oh no, you know, it's not realistic enough or something. Yeah. It's just crazy. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, just no. <laughs> well, I mean, fiction itself, I mean, I know that there's fiction that's maybe more literary, more realistic. You know, those people were arguing about nothing set in space, nothing in alternate realities, mm. nothing in augmented realities. It has to be set on what we know. And that's not how stories work, basically. I mean, we can't exclude those stories because fiction allows us to go different places, whether they're real or not. <laughs> and if we cut those out, it would be just too inclusive and... I mean, maybe there could be like a subcategory called, I think we were talking about earth fiction or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do just want to read. They don't really care for science fiction or fantasy. Um, I personally think science fiction has a broader, broader kind of explanation and definition than a lot of people think it's just being in outer space or something. No, it's, it's um, you know, it deals with credible science in our world. <laughs> um, just like ecofiction deals with ecology. Um, anyways, it's that was a kind of a silly argument. I, I I don't even know if it was an argument or just a debate, but um, most people agreed. No, we got to keep 
science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody is absolutely welcome to their preference. You know, your oh, yeah. library at home can be earthbound eco fiction mm -hmm. if you'd prefer, but um, to discredit everybody else's preferences was a bit. Yeah, or to change the path and the and the, a genre the that's, <laughs> that's ha been happening and evolving for for a, half a century to include all this stuff to suddenly take it out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we seem to be of the same opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, actually, the only question I have left for you is to ask for some recommendations, which I know you must be just bursting with recommendations <laughs> from, from your site. So lay it on us. Yeah. I, I wrote some down. I probably should go look at those. I mean, I've read so many good books. It's hard for me to, to really recommend uh, just a few. Uh, what I had written down is there's some books that I've actually gone, wow. And, um, and as opposed to, oh, that's good and thought provoking. Some books that I'm was just blown away by were Mu, Wu Ming Yi's The Man with Compound Eye, Pachaya Sutbanthod's um, Bangkok Wakes to Rain, Namwali Serpel's The Old Drift, Emmy uh, Iterata's Memory of Water. And one that I'm reading now that's just crazy is Christiane Badness's Fauna, which is weird fiction, <laughs> of course. Of and, course. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's so many more beyond that. I think if you go to the site um, and kind of look at the interviews that I've done, uh, the spotlights that I'm doing on authors, um, those are equal to some good recommendations, um, as well as the medium articles that are going around the world in 80 books. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I've, I've, I've read Bangkok Wakes to Rain and it was, it was really, really amazing. Um, I've not read the other ones, but uh, Memory of Water has been on my to, to be read list for <laughs> since yeah. the beginning and i think it's being made into a film now which is very exciting mm -hmm. um, yeah. but the others are are new additions so yeah i'll definitely I, actually be the... before i ever began those spotlights emmy was one of the first people i ever interviewed <laughs> for the oh, site really? she's very gracious to talk to you know nobody like me <laughs> <laughs> yeah she was uh really generous and kind and it's good to see that her movie's being made into a movie finally yeah i'm very excited for that well um that's all i have for you so um i guess all that's left is for me to thank you again for being here and for taking the time to talk to me i've really enjoyed having you on ecofictology thank you i'm honored by the way <laughs> oh thank you um and uh that's all from me so i will see you next week ecofictologists